Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear me. Can you hear me? Good. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Sam, as Anton said. Uh, so, raywendelick.com, I'm sure some of you have heard of it. It's like where you can go and read lots of tutorials. Well, behind that company, sorry, behind that enormous website, there's like a team of 10, 15 of us. And then there's lots and lots of people that write content. They write books, they make videos, and all that kind of stuff. But keeping the site running is about 10 or 15 of us. If any of you are interested in writing stuff for the site, then come and speak to me at the end. Um, but before that, I'm going to start talking about something different, and that is machine learning on mobile, a primer. But what I mean by primer is I'm actually going to talk quite a lot about what machine learning is, what it can be used for, why we like it, and all that kind of stuff. I'll talk a little bit about actually doing it on iOS, but a lot of what I'm going to talk about is applicable to all kinds of machine learning. So, CoreML is what made this popular, certainly in the iOS world, uh, like not this year, but last year. CoreML, new framework available on iOS that makes doing what machine learning really easy, really simple to use framework. So I thought, well, what, what does that mean? Well, Apple have very helpfully written on their website, with CoreML, you can integrate trained machine, learn, trained machine learning models into your app. Well, what does that mean? I mean, that, that in itself isn't the most helpful of descriptions, but don't worry, because they've got a really good diagram, which you can't really see, but over here it says ML model. There's this big thing in the middle that says CoreML, and then there's your app at the other end. So I think that explains exactly what you need to know about what CoreML does. Well done, Apple. That looks, that looks amazing. I decided to draw my own version of that diagram, because actually it is only three steps. Right over on the left-hand side, you've got input, you've got a box in the middle, and you've got some output. That sounds very much like stuff that we do every day, right? We write this box in the middle. It's a function. We have some input, we do something to it, and then we get some output. That is exactly what we do every day. The difference with machine learning is I don't know what this box is. Normally, if I'm going to sit down and write some code, I know what I want the function to do, I know how the function is going to work, and I will try and t bang around at the keyboard until the function does what I want it to. With machine learning, this box in the middle is done for you by the computer, by the machine. The machine learns what this function is. And that's basically all it is. It's a function that we don't write, somebody writes for us. Somebody, the computer, the machine, writes it for us based on some data that we've given it. So that's it. That's what machine learning is. It's this box in the middle. There are three kind of main things that you use machine learning for. The first one is classification. This is very much the one that you'll all have seen in like demos and things. Classification is... What, what, which of these groups does my input fit? So if you've seen, like the, the, the canonical example of machine learning is uh, giving, uh, give it, taking a photo and then the, your, your app telling you what's in that photo. That's classification. What you've done is say, out of all of these classes, what do I think is in this photo? So the, I, I've never watched this TV program, but the example of hot dog or something else. Hot dog or not hot dog? From Silicon Valley? Sausage. So, sorry? Sausage. Hot, hot dog or sausage? Something like that. I don't know what it is. But anyway, there's two classes there. It's, is it a hot dog? Is it not a hot dog? That's, that's all it is. So that's what classification is, is taking, I'm going to divide everything in the world into these set boxes, and then my machine learning algorithm is going to tell me, well, which of the boxes does it fit in? And that's what most of the machine learning stuff that we see is. Another one is regression, and this is kind of a bit more traditional, but it's given I've got all of this input, what value do I think the output should have? I've got lots and lots of numbers. Um, what's a good example of this? Um, being able to predict something like the temperature based on what the temperature was over the past few days or something. I teach it by giving it lots and lots of example data, and then it gives me a value, a value on some kind of continuous scale, usually. That's <coughs> regression. And then clustering is another one that's a little bit like classification, only this time we don't tell the machine, we don't tell the computer how, what the classes are. All we're asking it for is 
how uh, I've got all of this data. Can, which of these things look the same? It doesn't know anything about what they are, but it tries to guess what they are, it tries to cluster them together in a particular way. That one is a little bit more difficult to, to kind of use in real life. You'll often use clustering, and then on the end of that, you would put um, some classification. All three of these, and in fact all machine learning, follow exactly the same pattern. So we're going to look through what this pattern is. What we have to do, it follows the same procedure, irrespective of what you're doing. The first one is collect data. And for us, as software developers, this is probably the most difficult, the second most difficult thing that we have to do, is you need a lot of data. Quite often, you need lots and lots. If you're doing classification, you need to show lots of examples of each image that's going to go in each class. You need a lot of this data. The second one, and this is the most difficult part, or can be, is ground truth. And what that means is you, in order for the, the algorithm to learn how to classify things, or how to cluster things, you need to tell it, well, with all of this data that I've started off with, my training data, this is what's actually going on. This is a picture of a cow, this is a picture of a hot dog, this is a picture of a horse, this is a picture of a dog. And you do that with all of your sample data. It's called ground truth. The only way of doing that is by doing, by using the, the best way of doing that is by doing it yourself and going through and actually categorizing, clustering, regressing these things yourself. And it can that's the bit that is often very difficult to, um, to get over. Third one is extracting feature vectors. So in, in many case, no, in every case, you don't just take this big chunk of data. You need to extract from it some kind of vector, some kind of usually one-dimensional array of numbers. And the, the challenge there is, given my, what I want to do, say if I'm doing classification of two different types of things, what I want to do is take images that look like this and images look like this and I want to extract from that some kind of array of numbers that really easily determines the difference between these two classes. So I want to come up with a way of extracting those numbers in a way that massively separates them. And we'll see that a little bit more in the first example that I'm going to do is we need to work out what those feature vectors are. Then you train the model. So I've got my feature vectors and then I'm going to pass that into whatever model I've got all, these, are all the, these are all the feature vectors for one type. These are all the feature vectors of another type. Now you need to learn that if I give you a feature vector that looks like this, you need to tell me which type it came up, comes out as. Then you test it. So that's the, here's my model. I've got some more ground truth things. I want to tell you how good, tell me how good the model is. I'm going to give you this picture. I want you to tell me which one it is. No, you were wrong or you were right. And you do that so that you can then go and iteratively improve your model which is number six. Repeat three, four, and five. And you go round and round again. You're trying to work out, well, what's the best feature vectors? Can I retrain my model? Then I test it, and I go back, and I, can I improve my feature vectors? And you go round and round and round around this until you get a model that you like. Then you can deploy your model. So this is, I've now got my model. I'm going to put it out in the real world, and I can start using it. I can get it. I can start getting information from the data that I've collected using this model. And with that, you perform prediction. So these are those eight steps. Collect data, ground truth, feature vectors, train model, test model, repeat, round, around, 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 deploy the model and perform the prediction. So where does Core ML fit in with this? Core ML, big thing, yes, this is amazing, how fantastic, it released WWDC last year. Core ML does these two at the bottom. It does the deploy the model and the perform the prediction. All of this stuff, which some would argue the hard stuff, is not done by Core ML. Down at the bottom, the two bits that are potentially a bit easier are done for you. However, with... Oh, we've now lost number eight off the bottom. No, pretend number eight's there. It's not really relevant. There is something that came out in this year's WWDC called Create ML, which has a crack at doing these bits here for you. So this time last year, I'd just be talking about how Core ML's it's kind of good, but it doesn't really do the difficult stuff for you. Now you have an option, a very limited option, albeit, but a, a, an option to do these things as well, built into, uh, into iOS. Now these sections here, there's lots and lots of different ways of doing this, and if you, uh, I'll reference it a couple of times, but there is a talk this afternoon by Enrique that's going to be about one of the ways that you can 
uh, or one of the tools you can use to build your models and, hence, and deploy them as well. We're only really looking at, the, uh, at what machine learning is and a little bit about deploying models. Here are some of the different things, some of the different approaches for machine learning. Now, you may have heard of the bottom one, this neural networks down at the bottom here. That's the one that when people say machine learning, that's the thing that everybody thinks of. It's not the only one, and these are not the only ones either. Um, we're going to look at one called support vector machine in a bit more detail. And the kind of the point is to show that machine learning isn't just neural networks. Neural networks are very good. It's not just neural networks. You don't necessarily need neural networks. And certainly, this stuff's been around for years. It didn't used to be called machine learning. These top four used to be called statistics. But statistics isn't a very exciting name. So now it's called machine learning, as if that's going to be something that's really clever and a little bit like AI when there isn't that much AI going on, this kind of thing. So these, this collectively is all kind of machine learning. There's more stuff in there. Traditionally, we used to call it statistics. Um, and the one that I'm going to talk about is uh, support vector machine in a little bit more detail. And we will see a neural network at the end, don't worry. So what does CoreML actually do? Well, it supports all five of those things and other ones as well. And what it does is it abstracts across all of those different model types for you. So rather than if I'm going to use a support vector machine, I need to write some code to understand the support vector machine. I want to use it on a neural network, so I've got to throw my SVM code away and use my neural network code. You don't have to do that because CoreML provides an abstraction across all of these types and it provides a really efficient implementation of the querying of these models. It also provides a model interchange format, so you'll see ML model files. Again, this is something that, because machine learning came from, very much came from uh, like academic disciplines, they very much did not care about how easy it was to transfer models from one person to another. They cared about building the model, showing how good it was, and that was the end of it. With CoreML, there is a standard file format that you can use, and you can drop it into your app, and then you're that's it. That's basically all you have to do. And we'll see that again as well later. And finally, a device-optimized implementation. So depending what kind of model work you're doing, depending what kind of machine learning you're doing, then there are different ways to optimize it. For example, neural networks are basically just lots of adding and multiplying. They work really well on GPUs. So Apple provides a, a device optimized implementation of that, depending on your device, depending on the power constraints. All of that stuff is abstracted away from you. You just call it. So it's a really nice kind of way of doing that. Uh, and a consistent API. So you can use it on Mac OS. You can use it on iOS. It's consistent across devices. It's consistent across model types and all this kind of thing. So it is, uh, although I have been um, taking the piss out of it, it is a really quite nice addition to um, our tool belts. But I did say that just leaves the hard part. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the hard part actually is and an example of how you can go about the hard part. So I'm going to talk about support vector machines. And I apologize in advance for my drawing skills, because all of these diagrams are hand-drawn, as you'll see. A support vector machine, here's a graph. So I'm going to talk about one in two dimensions. So what a support vector machine is, is for the classification problem. So I've got a, I want to be able to decide, I've got this reading from somewhere. My reading in this example will be in two dimensions. So it's going to have like an X value and a Y value. It can be multidimensional. I'm going to have an X value and a Y value. And from that, I need to decide, is it, is it a good reading or is it a bad reading? And I've just called it good and bad here. These obviously could be... Um, uh, all kinds of things. An example later on, we'll have cow versus burger. Like those are the, that's the kind of thing we're going to do. Is it this category or is it this category? So I have a load of readings and I plot them on my graph and I call them good. These are my good readings. They're down here, so they've got this kind of shape. And then I also had a load up in the top left-hand corner that are bad. And what my, my question is, if I then take a reading of a point here, do I think that's a good one or a bad one? And that is all that a support vector machine does. And it's really simple, certainly in two dimensions it is. So this here is, the support, is what's called a supporting hyperplane. Don't worry about the word hyperplane. It sounds scary. In two dimensions, it's a line. And basically, your support vector machine algorithm works out, well, where should this line be? If I've got to draw a line between my 
between my two classes, where should that line be? And that's all it does. And then that means that when I get my point coming in here, I, this is my reading, I've taken a sample of something and it's plotted it here. Then what my, what my SVM does is say, well, which side of my supporting hyperplane, which side of my line is that point? And then uh, knowing that, I know that I'm going to categorize that as a good point or a bad point. <coughs> Notice that it does its best at trying to split the two categories. It's not necessarily always possible, like there's a good point here that's gone on the bad side, so there's, there's, it's not always going to be accurate, and that's where the testing and training comes in. And uh, also, this is only two categories. You can increase it to be more categories. The more categories you have, certainly in two dimensions, the more difficult it is to uh, differentiate between them. Um, and then this, I, I said that the supporting hyperplane in two dimensions is just a line in... In an example in three dimensions, so if you thought my drawing was bad, now see me trying to draw something in 3D. We've got the same kind of thing. We've got good points and we've got bad points. Here, a supporting hyperplane is a plane, right? So however, however many dimensions your data is, and don't worry, I'm not going to try and draw more than three dimensions. However many dimensions your data is, then one dimension less is your hyperplane. So if you're in eight-dimensional space, then seven dimensions is a plane in that space, which is a bit weird, right? You don't need to draw it, you don't need to worry about it. The important thing is, you are, there is a n minus one sized subspace, dimensional subspace, that will completely spit your space in two. And that's all you care about. And then you do exactly the same thing. I've got a point, I find how close it is to the, the supporting hyperplane, and then using that, then I can determine which side I am. So that is what SVMs are. That is machine learning, and that is far easier than neural network-based machine learning, which we will look at what that means as well later. But when, when somebody says machine learning, and they probably mean neural networks, it's not the only thing. This is a perfectly acceptable, perfectly serviceable, and potentially quite a good use of um, machine learning. So I want to do an example of sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis, this is... Um, this is uh, natural language processing based uh, machine learning. So what that means is I've got some text and I want to determine the sentiment of that text. Uh, the example I'm going to do, and the example is often done, is using movie ratings. Uh, and it uses this technique called bag of words. So if I've got, sorry, not movie ratings, a movie review. So I've got a movie review and I want to know does this person think that this is a good movie or a bad movie based on what they've written in their review? And you think, actually, that's, that for us to understand, that's quite easy because we can read it and we can interpret it. But for a computer, it's more difficult. And there's a really simple technique called bag of words, which is OK at doing it. All bag of words does is it takes, it counts the number of occurrences of each word in the review and then it looks to see, well, we see that like, when people write good quite a lot, then it's probably a good review. If they write pants, it's probably not a good review. So they kind of use that and it builds it up. It's really simple. There's lots and lots of ways that you can extend it to be um, more complex. Um, so I'm going to have a really quick demo of this. And I'm going to give the, the demo of how you go about building up a machine learning model to do this and then how you import it and how you use it inside Xcode. So I'm using, uh, so because we're in machine learning, that's tiny, tiny, tiny writing. Can we make it bigger? We can make it bigger. That's still quite tiny. Um, so because we're doing machine learning, that means we're using Python, because that's what the world uses for machine learning, it seems. It's, unless you're in academia, in which case you probably use MATLAB, but the real world can't afford MATLAB. Um, and there are some really nice modules available for doing machine learning. There's, so the, you don't, don't worry about what's on the screen. I'm just going to point out some particular bits of code. But there's, this thing, there's a thing called sklearn, which is scikit-learn. So scikit is a, a scientific computing package, and then scikit-learn within there does machine learning stuff. There's something called NumPy, which is for doing lots of numerical calculations in Python. The important part here is this thing called CoreML tools. CoreML tools is made by Apple, and it allows you to take standard machine learning models from other places and turn them into CoreML things and export them. So all I want to show here is 
Uh, well, first of all, I want to show you what the data looks like. So I've said this movie reviews and they're positive or negative. So if I open up this page and have a quick look in here, then what I've got is a big load of negative reviews and a big load of positive reviews. So um, these are just text files. Um, and this is stuff that somebody has been and they've extracted this content and somebody's ground truthed it to be a negative review or a positive review. Um, so I've got loads of these. I don't know how many there are. There's a, like, and then loads and loads of these. And then same for positive reviews. I've got a load in here. They're for different films, um, but they're, um, they're all kind of user-submitted reviews. They've been normalized a bit, so we've taken out like, punctuation and stuff will get removed. But it is basically just a big, long review, and then somebody's decided, is it generally positive or generally negative? So I've got loads of those, and that's what happens down here is all I'm going to do is import all of those into my Python. You don't need to worry about what's going on. But basically, I import all of those things in. I put the text of one kind in a load of positive ones, the text of another kind in a load of negative. I also split it into training and testing. Remember before I spoke about how you do training and how you do testing? I want, s I want most of my data to be used for training, but once I've trained something, I need to know, well, how good is the model that I've built? So you also have a load of testing testing data and then you'll go you'll repeatedly test it and then change some parameters and retest it again until you get to a point that you're really happy with um, the model then I spoke about how you create feature vectors so a feature vector for one of these is I was talking about a bag of words it's literally just a count it's normalized slightly don't worry about that it's a count of how uh, of each of these words that we've determined are important in determining whether or not a review is positive or negative, what, how many times does that appear in a review? And that's all this is doing. It looks a bit more complicated than that, but all it's doing is going through and it's pull it, counting out how many times does it say the word good? How many times does it say the word um, frightened? How many times does it say the word green? And it'll just do that and it'll create these vectors, one vector for each of the, um, uh, for each of the sample uh, each of the samples that I've got. And with that uh, vector that it's come, that's now just, because it's like a, um, uh, like a histogram, this is just a one-dimensional array of numbers, which is what we like. So now I've got those, then I'm using, a, using something inside, there's a package called SVM. I'm using something called, uh, just using that to generate an SVM. So what that's doing is taking these, these vectors, which I think are about 20,000 things long. So we've got a, an array that's 20,000 long. So I'm going to plot that in 20,000 dimensional space. And then this, cla uh, this classifier, this linear SVM classifier, is going to try and find a 19,999 subspace that nicely divides the positive and negative reviews which sounds more difficult than it is. SVMs are fairly standard. Way. There's different kernels and things you can do, but it's all fairly standard, not that difficult. So that's all we're doing here is going to do that, and then we uh, get the prediction out of the end of it. And then right down here, so I, now I've, I've done that. I've created my SVM. I've got, an, I've got this model, which I can give it one of these vectors, and it will tell me whether or not it thinks it's a positive or negative review. And then down here, I'm using some Core ML tool stuff to convert the model that I've created into a, uh, into something that, into a Core ML model. So that's all it does. There's some stuff at the end here that are about feature weights and creating feature vectors. All of this stuff's on GitHub if you want to take a look through it. I'm not going to go into it in great detail now. If you want to talk to me about it later, then do feel free. The key thing is that once I've done this, I've got created a file called Movie Review Sentiment, and it's in the format of Core ML. So if I then head off into this project, which you've not got a hope in hell of seeing, but I can zoom in. This here, can you see that? Yeah. So this here is my Movie Review Sentiment ML model. All I have to do once I've created that, this case using Python, if I drag that into Xcode, then Xcode now understands this is a, this is a Core ML model. I'm going to use it for um, machine learning. It generates a class for you. It tells me the input. It tells me what the input is. So here it's called a multi-array, which for us is, uh, in this case, it's just a one-dimensional array of length. Oh, not, it's not 20,000. It's 12,000. So there's 12,000 long, this feature vector. And then it outputs a class label and a class probability. So the class label will be positive or negative, and the probability will be, well, it'll be the probability that it's positive versus the negative. 
And what it does is it generates this Swift class for you called Movie Review Sentiment. Uh, here it is, movie, re movie Review Sentiment. And because it's generated that, it makes it super easy to use in code. So I'm going to show you that a l very briefly. Let's make this text a bit bigger. That I use in my sentiment analyzer. And the important part for this is here, I create this model, I instantiate this model. And then I have this thing called predict sentiment. And I have this thing that generates a feature vector. So remember that I have, I, I was talking about how you take the review and then you turn it into this big array of how many times does each word appear in there. That array that, that, array that is going to be um, 12,000 things long, so I need to generate that. I've written a class that does that for me. Um, and then from that, it generates the, the class probability. So what does that actually look like? If I build and run this, and I've got an app that, oh, you can't see because it's tiny. Come here. So I've got this app here, and it's got um, down the side uh, so it has these different reviews and then you can see it runs the sentiment analysis on that review and then tries to work out does it think this is a good film or a bad film so the, the green red line gives you an idea of the probability distribution and then the thumbs up thumbs down shows you its decided class so like for example the single worst movie I've ever seen it correctly predicted that that's a negative review um, but some of these are a little bit difficult to actually determine. I mean, that one there clearly is a positive review. Um, so, I mean, whether or not this, how good this is, is, diffi is difficult to actually decide. But that there is running machine learning on these movie reviews to try and predict, did this person think this was a good review or a bad review? And we did all of that ourselves. There was no, like, there was, although I didn't show you, didn't go through the lines of code, there was nothing complicated there. I literally downloaded those things, I ran that, those bits of Python, and then I put it together, created a core ML file, imported it, and then ran it. There was nothing there that involved me knowing a lot of data science. It wasn't massively complicated. So that's quite cool, right? Um, I'm gonna back, jump back to some slides. That was uh, a support vector machine classifier, quite a simple one. You can do more complex ones with more, uh, with more classes, but it's not, uh, it's not generally as good as convolutional neural networks. That me does, doesn't mean to say you should never use them, because there are times when things are quite easy to classify, and you should just use the simplest thing you've got. Convolutional neural networks, so excuse me in advance again for more terrible diagrams. I'm going to talk about the example with an image because, I mean, they're used for absolutely anything, but we're, they're commonly used for images, or most commonly used in the software development environment for images. So how do convolutional neural networks work? And this is a very, very high level, quick summary of it, so that you've got some kind of idea in your head how they work. So you take an image, in fact, you take a load of images, and then you run this thing called a convolutional kernel. So convolution is, uh, is, is a fairly simple mathematical operation. It's basically um, it's kind of like a two-dimensional dot product, but it's basically you just um, point multiply um, sum, and then you run that, you raster scan it across the entire image. That's all you do. And this is why we quite like this, is because what you're doing in a convolution kernel is you're multiplying and you're adding. Both of things, and uh, multiplying and adding floating point numbers, which the GPU is really good at. It's really cheap to do. No nothing there is difficult. The difficult bit is actually, what is this convolutional kernel? And we'll look at that in a minute. That there is called a convolution layer. So we're talking about convolutional neural networks. That is a convolution layer. Is just take a convolution kernel and run it over your image or sequence of images. And then you'll get, this you'll get this output, which will be um, 
of a higher dimensional standard. You'll get loads of them because you're going to run lots of different convolutional kernels over it. And you end up with masses of data here. Too much data. So then what you do is you do some non-linear non downsampling. Why do we do non-linear downsampling? Because again, that's really cheap. What do I mean by non-linear downsampling? That means I'm not going to do some kind of nice um, visual downsampling. I'm going to take the maximum. I'm going to take the, the minimum. Something really simple. I'm just going to take the top left square or something. Really simple downsampling. And you do that so that you end up with less data. Again, this is a really cheap operation. We love cheap operations. That's called a pooling layer because your convolutional layer will massively expand the amount of data you've got. You then drop it down again with a pooling layer using nonlinear downsampling. Okay. Then what you can do with this, or what you do right at the end of this, sorry, a, a, a convolutional neural network takes this, this model, this little piece, and it repeats it multiple times. The better a convolutional neural network, the more layers there are, kind of. The, the, the only bit here that's difficult is working out what should this convolution kernel be. We'll talk about that in a minute. Once you've got, so you've got a load of these connected, then at the end, we're back to what this is doing is generating a feature vector for me. The thing that comes out of the end will be some like, multi-dimensional array. We're just going to scan it so that it flatten it so it's into one dimension. That's our feature vector. And then we have a load of classes at the other side. So we have a feature vector, and we've got a load of classes we want our thing to be in. We do some incredibly simple um, techniques to combine, turn our feature vector into classes. We do a weighted sum, and then we do softmax, both of which, again, are incredibly cheap, simple operations. A weighted sum of our feature vector, and then we, uh, and we blend into each, each of these classes has a weighted sum, and then softmax is a, 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 a um, pretentious way of basically saying that it's a normalized, normalized sum. That's called a fully connected layer. That takes all of our, all of our feature vector outputs, and it, they get fully connected into, the problem, uh, into our classes at the other side. As I said, we have a load of these together, and then at the end, there's this fully connected thing which does classification. So, what is cool about convolutional neural networks? The most expensive part, as I said, was working out what the convolutional, um, uh, what the convolution kernel looks like, what those values are in there. It's just a load of numbers. What are they? Really hard to do. It takes massive amounts of computing power, which is why people like Google are very good at creating these things. However, once you've built this, because it's just adding and multiplying, this is really cheap to do, which is why we like doing it on mobile devices. You couldn't, you could train this on a mobile device. I wouldn't recommend it. But the other cool thing about uh, neural networks in this feature vector generation is you can take the first part of a neural network and then just add your own little bit on the end of it and it works surprisingly well. It's kind of weird how this works. So if you look at the academic literature, everybody starts out with the current neural network. Like a few years ago it was Google Net. Everybody starts out with Google Net and then they tack their own stuff on the end of it. And we can do exactly the same and in fact that's what we do. The example I want to give is called salient object subitizing. I'm going to go really quickly because I'm running out of time. It's a slightly, I'm going to give two examples actually. The first one is salient object subitizing. Slightly different to what we normally do, but we can use core ML again to do this. So what is salient object subitizing? Um, it is a way of, subitizing is being able to count how many things there are in a picture. Now, I don't know what those things are. I want you to know how many there are. Something we are really good at, unless there's a lot. I couldn't tell you how many people there are in this room, but you can look at my fingers and tell me that I'm holding three up. We are really good at that. Computers less so. However, I found an um, academic paper about salient object subitizing, and they provided a trained model in this format called CAFE, CoreML tools to the rescue again. That can import CAFE and it can turn it into a um, CoreML model. So again, a little bit of Python to do that. I've done that. And that means that when I go over to here, oh, sorry, go over to here, which is the salient object subitizing app that I've built, I've got this SOS ML model. So that's the thing that I exported from their published model. I've imported it into my own project. It's created the class for me. 
You notice that it's a 23 megabyte neural network. That's actually not that big for a neural network. You can get ones that are much bigger. The input is an image and it outputs a multi-array. And then to use it, I, it's quite a fairly simple thing to do. There's this uh, VN Core ML model. So that is, there's a, a, a uh, framework called Vision and that integrates really nicely into Core ML. So I've got this thing here and it builds this model. It bases it on the Vision Core ML model. And then down here, if I find the right bit of code, it gets the image. We make a request to that model. So all I'm doing is I give it a model and I tell it, tell me what the results are, given that I'm going to give you this image. And then down at the bottom here, I, get, uh, I actually call this handler to go and make that request. So again, I know I'm skipping over the code. The important thing here is there's about 15 lines of code to do this. And then if I show you really quickly what it can do, So this is the app. I'm going to choose a picture. So I'm going to choose this thing here, which is a picture of a lighthouse. And what it does is it looks at that picture and says, well, there's only one thing in there, whatever that thing is. Or I can look at this one here, which is a picture of two dogs. It reckons that there's two things in there, uh, and etc. So I could choose this one here. It's got three pizzas in it, and it reckons there's three things. It knows nothing about what pizzas are, but it's able to look at it and say, well, it looks like there's three things in there. It's not, I mean, it's, it's not infallible, but it's, I'm kind of impressed that you can do this as a fairly simple machine learning thing. And it's different from the, is it, is it a hot dog kind of thing. Um, so I've not got many minutes left at all. I want to talk very briefly about Core ML and hopefully, uh, sorry, Create ML and hopefully show you how you can do that. Because I've spoken for a great length about why this is so hard. Building these models is so much harder than using them. And up until like three or four months ago, you had to do all of that yourself. So it's not like I showed you how to do it in Python, I showed you how to steal somebody else's model, but actually now you can use your, you can build your own models as long as you've got really, really confined contexts that you want to use them in, and that's using CreateML, which is a new Mac OS framework. It's in whatever the current Mac OS is called. I don't know, some place in California. Um, it's very limited, as I said, but pretty powerful, and I want to show you very quickly how you can do that. So if I open a playground, I've got this playground here. This is a Mac OS playground, and I've imported this framework called Create ML UI. So there's like two lines of code to do this, and I build this, or not build it, I run it. Do I run it? Come on. Come on. Come on. There we go. And what it does is it starts this little thing up here, which is this image classifier. And it's a really nice, easy to use thing. I want to show you what you have to do with it. So I have created, I'm going to do this thing called cow or burger. And I've got some testing data and some training data. So my training data has a load of pictures of burgers and a load of pictures of cows. And all I want to know is, can I build a network that tells me is it a cow or is it a burger? So I'm going to Oh, God's sake. The reason that this works so nicely is because inside, uh, oh, for goodness sake, inside iOS, then they have neural networks that you're already using. You, they use them inside, why can't I pick it up? Goodness sake. Like, get in there. Get in there. Why? Oh. I'm going to stop in a minute. Right, I'm going to just quit Xcode, because that's what you do. Go away. I'll try it once more, and if it doesn't work, I'll give up. Um, so the, you have, you know, I sp spoke about how you've got a neural network, and you can take the first part of it and then tack your own stuff on the end. This is doing precisely that. It takes the, the neural network that it's built, the quite complex neural network that it has already built, inside iOS, inside macOS, that does, your, does all of the clever stuff with your photos, all of the clever stuff with your messages and that kind of thing. Um, it's not going to work. Why won't you work? Does anybody know how to use a computer in here? <laughs> I clearly don't. Last go. Oh, f <laughs> Right, just imagine that worked, because it really was very simple. 
Literally, what would happen is you drop those things in there, it scans through your images. You then scan through, you then drop your test data in, which again is a load of stuff that looks like cows and a load of stuff that looks like burgers. It tells you how accurate your model is based on those photos, and then you can export an ML file in exactly the same way that I did with the other two. So if you're doing simple image classification, you can also use it for natural language processing, um, and you can also use it for uh, generalized data regression. So really, three very constrained cases, but quite powerful cases, then Create ML can be quite powerful and it's worth having a look at. So in conclusion, don't try and drag things into Xcode because it doesn't work. That's my first conclusion. Um, Core ML is a really small part of the story. And that used to be the conclusion I came up to, is that actually it does just the easy bit. It does it really nicely, but it just does the easy bit. Doesn't mean it's not useful. It's still really quite useful. It's got that format, it's got the optimizations on the device, and it has that consistent API. So it's potentially exciting times. More so, if you want to use one of those constrained things, then you, without understanding data, much data science, you can go in and you can start building, as software engineers, your own, um, uh, your own machine learning models and deploy them to your apps really easily. Uh, a little bit of a plug right at the end here. I do work for these people, so they, I should say hello to them. Um, so we are releasing a book called Machine Learnings by Tutorials. It's already available. Uh, do take a look at it. We're on raywenderlich.com. Um, and if you send me an email or a tweet, I will see... Uh, uh, I, yeah, send me an email or drop in my DMs and I'll organise you a discount for it. Uh, code for this will be at this URL here, which looks really easy to read. I'm Sam at RaiseWare.com and I want my real name on Twitter. Thank you ever so much for watching, listening, and sorry for talking for too long. Thank you. Yeah.